Okay, so um, yeah, so I'll be talking about knot theory. Um, the first thing uh, I guess I wanted to get out was that in my abstract, I said I'll be going over cipher surfaces and the fundamental group of a knot. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to those last two things, but um, I was able to go into other segments and dive deeper into those. Uh, actually, my last argument that I have, um, which will be an invariant that I'll be presenting, I just actually figured out at 4 o'clock this morning, so that's pretty good. Um, also, another thing that seemed to almost mess me up was when I was going through a few papers, I actually accidentally stumbled into a combinatorial knot theory, which, in, which instead of using uh, smooth curves, uh, we just actually just use uh, polygonal ones. So we just use a uh, um, collection of vertices and points um, instead of our regular smooth thing. So instead of having something like this, you will literally just have a collection of edges and vertices. Um, however, there isn't a big consequence to this because given a smooth curve, one can easily approximate it by a piecewise linear one. And given this, um, a piecewise linear curve, you can just smooth out the edges and make a smooth curve. Um, well, that's all I want to say about that. So I guess we'll start off with defining a knot. Um, So again, how I have it is I'm going to I'm going to try to where where it's necessary. I'm going to try to present its usual representation as a smooth curve versus um, this combinatorial representation or this graph theoretical representation. So a knot will define as a non-self intersecting curve embedding in R three. So that's the usual representation. And for the representation I'll be using is just not as a simple closed polygonal, polygonal curve, right? So with this representation, we see that we can represent our knot uh, with by the union of segments, and these segments are P1. P2, comma, P2, P3, all the way up to, and these will be this, these will be for distinct points. So an ordered pair of distinct points. So another thing which you want to do, so in knot theory, um, it's usually hard to uh, look at things in three-dimensional Euclidean space. So what you want to do is you want to you want to have a way of projecting thing, things down so you can be more comfortable. So that's where you get um, the projection of a knot, and we define the projection of a knot a very simple definition. So we have that the image, and I'll abbreviate a lot of these because it's a lot to write. So the image of a knot K under a projection map. It's called, very simply stated, the projection of K. So more formally, one can present this as a function F that goes from R3 to R2. Uh, I guess you can define it by, um, so literally taking in three points and splitting out one. Is that all? Okay. So how we're going to be looking at this is, okay, so we're going to be taking this orthogonal projection. So I'm going to have a knot that looks something like this with some thickness, and I'm going to be projecting it down into this plane that's going to be a subset of R2, right? So we're going to have something that looks like this, right? And immediately we see, we see that we need to define this definition because usually with projections, you need to remedy information being lost. And we see that information that's being lost is going to be at these double points, and when we try to determine which strands are going over and which strands are going under, right? So one will usually present uh, the definition of a regular projection, and so a regular projection will just be so we will say a knot projection is regular if we have these two things being satisfied. 
So one, we have that uh, no three points on our not projection, on our not project to the same point. And what this is basically saying is we want to allow we want, we, we want to allow double points, but we don't want to allow there be a third point that actually maps onto this double point. Does that make sense? Okay. And our next thing what we do is we don't want to allow so we don't want we don't want any vertex to project to the same point as any other point of the knot. And this just literally comes from my definition of wanting our knot to be non-intersecting. So we don't want that any vertex hits another point on this knot. Is that cool? By vertex, do you mean intersection? Yes. Yeah. So I'll give you an example of this. So this would be an example of our second definition versus our, our third definition, which is in a refinery. So, bear with me on the drawing. <laughs> right? So, okay. So this will be the definition where we just gave our our regular projection of a knot. Well, not our regular projection, but uh, what preceded the latter uh, definition, where we don't we don't want to allow these things to occur, right? So we don't want to allow there being any intersections on our projection, right? So what we see here this is what this this is what our second this is what our third definition did for us. It didn't allow for uh, in our projection for there to be an intersection, right? So then, well, the last thing we ask is, is this, is this what we want still? So with all this buildup of definitions, we're just trying to make sure that when we have something in three-dimensional Euclidean space, when we project it down and we start, because we're going to be studying this diagram, we just want to make sure that we're looking at the right things when we start observing characteristics of this knot in R2. Right? So the last thing we want to do is um, we want to define what does it mean uh, for a knot diagram. So the knot diagram will just be our regular projection with the edit that we use gaps to remedy what, what is going on at the double points. So whether things are going over and things are going under. So the definition of knot diagram would just be the drawing of our regular projection. And simply yes, with gaps to remedy issues. I don't know. Does that make sense? Some technical arguments where we look at our picture, we'll call we'll call these double points, we'll we'll call these uh, crossings, and we'll refer to the arcs of our diagram as edges. And as you go along um, the knot, um, over crossings and under crossings adhere to our natural intuition. So, just another quick example of how we would count these. So this is the unknot at zero crossings. And do you ever call it the not knot? Huh? Do you ever call it the not knot? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not the right way to think about it. <laughs> Definitions 
is um, given, given a tangled loop, you want to try to figure out, um, is it exactly knotted? And given two knots, you want to try to figure out when can one be deformed into the other, right? So traditionally, what was done is um, you would be given a knot, and you would try to put you know, certain moves on it, and you would see whether you can get it to the unknot, which is this image here, which is something that's not knotted, and you would conclude it's not knotted. Right. <laughs> so, but see, see, but that's not a good strategy because it could have been the case that you just weren't clever enough to actually get it to something like this, right? So, actually, what we just did, we stumbled across our first thing, which we need to introduce about knots, is called um, a knot invariant. So, an invariant will be a characteristic of a knot that doesn't change when you put these certain moves on it. So, this will allow you to be able to distinguish whether you know two knots are the same or not. <laughs> so we'll define the crossing number. Uh, I guess I can know this. Yes. So the crossing number denoted um, C of K um, is the least number of crossings that can occur in any projection. So it's the least number of crossings. that can occur in any projection of our given now. So actually, OK, so it's actually pretty hard to determine whether, um, to determine the crossing number of a given knot. What you would do is, if someone gives you a knot, you automatically know how many crossings it has, call it n crossings. You automatically know that the actual crossing number of the knot that you were given is going to be less than you would have had, right? So, and then what you would hope to happen is that the crossing numbers for all the knots below um, the crossing number that you know the person gave you has have actually been tabulated already. So, if someone gave you a knot with seven crossings, since all the knots with seven crossings have been tabulated already, you can easily go through and try to identify what knot you have, right? But if you're given something actually with a crossing number greater than or equal to 15, all knots um, below 15, their crossing numbers haven't been determined yet. So what you need to do is uh, there's actually um, there was a method that would that came out in 1980s, which which actually uh, proves some interesting things about this result, but its applications go out of the scope of this talk, so I'm not going to be talking about it. So our first invariant comes sadly. Okay, so the next thing I'll be talking about uh, is the orientation of a knot. This will be this will be really helpful when we start describing uh, connected sums of knots, and would have been helpful if I would have got to cipher services in which explicitly you need for your knots to be oriented. Right. So I'll give the definition of what it means for a knot to be oriented. So an oriented knot. Consist of a knot and an ordering of its vertices, and that's pretty much it. So I'll give you an example. So the example will just be given uh, to show how you would orient a knot if it's a smooth curve versus how you would orient a knot if you present it as a graph. So I won't go into a number of these, but given a smooth curve, how you present its orientation is with these arrows, and given this, um, given this knot in its uh, um, graph theoretical sense, what you would do is you would just place an ordering on the vertices. And with this, we see that we will say that an ordering is the same if it, di if it differs by some cyclic permutation. Do we have to follow any sort of normal intuition about ordering? I mean, can I go one, five, three, two, six, or something? Oh yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess in, in, in graph theory, this would be uh, this this order would be suggested as I guess you would call it a directed graph. Okay. Right. 
So the next thing in the study of knots, it's useful to consider objects where um, the number of loops knot is bigger than one. And with that, we come to this notion of um, defining what a link is. So a link will define, so a link is just, is a collection of disjoint knots. Uh, more formally, you can say the link is just a union of a finite number of knots with, right, because knots are a set of points, so you can represent it this way. So, uh, um, when, when talking about links, this also leads us to our next invariant, in which I'll pose a question, are these two, are these two knots the same? Uh, I'll this right. Um, Describe this as link two, and we'll say no because cardinality of the links for this one is one versus the cardinality of the links for this one is, did I count this right? Uh, yes, one link, and then this one is linked with two other things. Right. So that introduces us to our next invariant. Uh, okay, pop it right here. So we'll define the linking number, denoted L of K. Right? So the linking number we see is a numerical invariant. Um, that describes the linking number of two closed curves. So, describes the linking number of two closed curves. Um, some remarks, um, the fact that the linking number is the only invariant uh, can be easily proven by placing one circle in standard position and then showing that the linking number is the only invariant of the other circle. So this is just proving that you know this is in fact an invariant, but we'll just go with assuming that it's an invariant. So there's actually a unique way to compute the linking number. Um, its algorithm is given by, so I guess we'll call this algorithm for computing the linking number and I'll give it in this shorthand notation. Um, so what you do is, you label each crossing as positive or negative according to these following rules. And the rules are pretty easy. So, when you go over, you'll denote this as a, pro a positive crossing, right? And vice versa, when you just go in the opposite direction, but still have an over crossing, you'll denote this as positive. However, when you go, let's see, uh, okay. When you have an under crossing, that would be a negative. Something, okay. When you go the opposite way, you also denote that as a negative crossing. And I have some examples that we can do, but I just have to erase this first. Right. So generally, we can just view the linking number as the amount of times uh, two curves, two closed curves, wind about each other, right? And that's how we'll count it. So I'll give you an example. I'll let you do a few examples. Um, again, bear with me on the pictures. Right. So we see the linking number. Okay, so one thing I'll tell you is that um, 
the orientation, uh, whether it's positive or negative, adheres to what we learned in vector calculus. So what do you think the linking number of this would be then? I guess it's easily viewed like this. So again, it's the number of times that the knots uh, wind about each other. So this linking number is going to be negative one. Does that make sense? Because, okay, so, okay, so it's the number of times that this is going to wind about this, right? So remember, we're going to be in, in, in vector calculus when we're going this way, that denotes um, negative orientation, right? So we're going to go around this just, just one time. It only goes around one time, so it's negative one. So, so, so what would happen if I reverse orientation? Positive one. Positive, that's it. Okay, so. But wait, you said before that we do it for each crossing. It looks like there's two crossings. Mm -hmm. there. Well, it only goes, okay, so yeah, so for, so for each of the crossings, so I guess the second, the second thing I said is, it's just gonna be, how you're gonna compute it, it's just gonna be the amount of times that it winds around on each other, right? So here we just have you know, a circle in its standard position. I'm gonna take something different, and I'm gonna wind it around um, one of the arcs of this circle, right? So we actually only have one thing going on here. So remember, so like to wind something, so we're not gonna count this, 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 this under thing, we're gonna count when it actually goes over. Okay. So if, if we look at the upper diagram there, and we, see, we seem to see two intersections, can we use the little rules for positive and negative that you drew over there to get negative one from that? Yeah, but you would, I, I guess with, with this way, so yeah, this is actually one of the, the, the harder ones to see when you just had, you just had one link that was on it. When I viewed it this way, you can easily see that um, this will be a negative one. Again, because we're going in this orientation. So I guess, yeah, looking at it this way, it's pretty hard to look at when you're just looking at two links. But I think, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so you were, maybe you were about to say something about orientation. Yeah. Okay, so I'll ask my question after you talk about orientation. Oh, no, the, the, the orientation I was just saying is that we're going in this uh, this clockwise sense, mm -hmm. and back to calculus, we have negative orientation, so if I reverse the orientation, it'll be positive. How do we know what crossings to not use? Um, to, uh, so, so what you're going to be using is that you're going to count the crossings by how it winds around. So, 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 so how you wrap something. So I guess you just have to you know, think about it like, just, just a little bit. Well, so is this also dependent on projection because if we um, even if it's still going clockwise but maybe we're standing on the other side no it shouldn't change oh right? no because of the thing that you just said right. yeah it shouldn't change yeah, yeah. I mean I'll do another thing so that makes it invariant yes okay. Yeah. okay yeah is that cool right yeah but this next example of player one um let's let's look at this one and then we can ask more questions about it um, Better if I, Didn't you print the Yes. Yeah. So it would probably be better if I, what I'll do is I'll go in here so we can distinguish that these two actually are different ones. Right? So it's the linking number of these. Yeah. So it winds around, does it not wind around twice? So you missed it. Yeah, the bottom one, the white and yellow. Ah, oh, yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> this pin is a very hard to draw. So I, I, think, I, I think everybody's getting it. Yes, it's negative two. And if we reverse the orientation, it's positive two. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll pull it up. So does the other knot need an orientation? or? Is that, uh, like, so you don't have... Oh, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, I just didn't, I just didn't put it on it. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that, yeah, okay. yeah, that's, that's it. So you, so you see what orientation is important, right? So we need to determine, you know, what things are going over and what things are going under. And again, this all comes from the fact that we define properly what our projection is going to look like so we can examine things like this. Because without this, we, you know, our projection will be pretty messed up and we'll be able to, you know, determine, in fact, uh, these characteristics are or not. So there's actually uh, fact on um, the linking number 
it's actually going to be equal to n1 plus n2, n3 minus n4, all over 2, where n1, n2, n3, and n4, uh, these are going to represent our four times. Right? But I mean, I would say I would say going in and looking at the picture every time versus you know plugging into the formula would uh, I guess you would appreciate it a lot better. So we discussed some elementary invariants, um, which aid us in distinguishing knots. Um, and now we'll just uh, now we'll talk about uh, defining the equivalence on knots. So when two knots are equivalent, again, this comes back to what I was saying earlier about you know um, two knots. We try to give them two knots, and we try to see whether you can deform one into the other. And this leads to our definition of um, deformations. And again, the only reason why I define this is because again I'm taking this uh, graph theoretical approach in which you know um, I'm using lines, I'm using edges and vertices versus your natural, you know, smooth curves. So, so we'll say an IJ is called an elementary deformation of the knot K. So we have so we have a given knot K and we're going to perform a move that's going to be represented by J, right? Um, if one is determined by a sequence of points represented by P1 to Pn, and the other, um, again, determined by sequence of points And again, after I finish right now, I'll clarify what exactly is going on. And we need to have two things hold. So where the first thing, um, P naught, is a point that is not collinear with P1 and Pn. And then we're going to have that uh, the triangle span by P naught, P1, and Pn um, intersects uh, the knot determined by, sorry, it's a pretty long definition, um, P1, P2, and Pn only in the segment P1 to Pn. Okay, so what is this all exactly saying? So we're saying, so we're gonna be given a knot K J is going to be um, our deformation, basically our move that we're going to put on our knot K, right? And where we have, you know, so, so, so this is going to be our knot K, right? And then this is going to be J. And you might say, you know, where is this P naught coming from? It's going to come from the fact that if I'm given something that looks like this, right? What I'm going to do is if I make a move, we see that we might have to add a point, right? So we might have to add something that adds a point, right? So this is where J is taken over. So it's going to say, so you're going to be adding one point at a time, versus which would be a lot harder if you're working with smooth curves. You can add an infinite amount of points because you're working with a curve versus just working with you know um, edges and vertices. And the points that we're making here is the fact that. The points that we're making here is the fact that we don't want. When we do this, we don't want this to happen, right? We don't want these points to be collinear because, in fact, you're not doing anything if this happens, right? And then we also, so, and then this last thing is just, again, making sure that when we're putting this move zone, we don't intersect things, right? Because remember, so when we're working on a knot diagram, we're working in two dimensions, we don't have the ability to go over things, right? We can only see looking down, so we don't want things to hit each other, right? So this is just saying that if I if I have something that looks like this, you know, I want to allow this to happen versus if I have something like this, when I put a move on it, I don't want that to happen. I don't want the triangle spanned by these three points to intersect um, the original knot. Does that make sense?
Okay, so with that definition of performing things, we can easily say now, what does it mean for two knots to be equivalent? And basically what that would mean is that two knots would be equivalent if there's a finite number of moves that you can put on our original knot K to get to J. Right? And let's just put this down for just a moment. So we define this as knot equivalence. So we'll say that uh, two knots, J and K, are called equivalent if there exists a sequence of knots. So again, K, right? K1 up to Kn, I guess vice versa. Um, with each K sub i plus one being an elementary information of its predecessor. Does that make sense? So we're saying that two knots can be equivalent. Again, if you can put a finite, mover, finite number of moves on one knot to get to the other, and then you also need that each um, deformation to get from uh, one point K sub i to the next one, you need it to adhere to these two rules. So now I guess with this, um, I noted that um, now we can uh, more precisely define the objective of knot theory. It'll just be the study of equivalence classes of knots. So proving that um, so proving that something is not a non-trivial knot would be the same thing as proving that it's not in the equivalence class of, of, of the unknot. And proving that two knots are different will just be the same thing as proving that they lie in two different equivalence classes. So when you're doing all these moves, right, and you have something that's untangled, so say I so you say you have to do something that's like really tangled up, right? And you're trying to figure out, you know, you put in different moves on it, and then you don't know whether you're doing the same move that you so you may have did a move and undid it sometime later, or you may have done a move that you think is different. So it was it was proposed and proved by Kurt Reinemeister that there are actually only three moves that you need to actually show that two knots are equivalent up to planar isotopy. So remember, we're moving in a plane, and isotopy is just a fancy word for describing that we're going to put moves on this certain thing in the plane as we go from one knot to the other knot. So I'm just going to abbreviate it R moves because I spell it wrong every time. So <laughs> the, three, the three moves, we have the type one move, right? We'll literally just be taking a strand and twisting it, right? So we go from here to here, just twist it over. A type two move will just be starting with two strands and then just crossing them, right? Ah, it's kind of rough. And a type three move will just be having, if you have some crossing, right, it will just be literally picking, let's see, I'll put it down first. It will literally just be picking a strand and putting it over something that's already knotted, or some, or some crossing that's already happened. And again, the theory suggested was that two knots of links are equivalent if their diagrams are or the, the diagrams are related by a sequence of these Rademeister moves. And the proof of that is actually, it's actually not hard, but it's really technical. It's probably like three or four pages long. So again, we're going to say knots are equivalent if we can, if we can put um, a variation of these Rademeister moves, a finite number of variations of these Rademeister moves on one given knot such that it gets us to the other. So, so I'm going to ask you, are these two the same? And again, bear with me on the pictures.
Frank, so what do you think? You think yeah. they're the same? Yeah. It's kind of hard to tell, right? I, I think they're the same. I think they're not. I think they're Well, we're all thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so because... Uh, there's two of the crossovers. The one on the left is four. I think you can create new crossings in the right. Right, so you take the top left corner and the top right and just pull it. And then you got the same thing. Uh, we can perform a Reitemeister 3 move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you ignoring the orientation here? Uh, yes. Okay. So, okay, so I guess I'll stop. So, I'll stop right here, right? Because this is what we have, right? This is what I have on the board, oh, yeah. right? So, okay. They're going to actually number the moves, right? Magic, magic, magic. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, they actually were the same. And the only reason why I decided to do a video because it would be a lot easier to see it that way versus this board representation of me trying to put it on the board. Okay, so with that being said, this is where all the fun stuff starts to happen. So we have a lot of build up, a lot of easy concepts, and this is where things get a lot fun. These were actually the most difficult things for me to hatch out, but I think they ended up working. Um, so next, what I'll give you um, is a polynomial invariant uh, described by Alexander. Um, I won't be able to prove that it's in fact an invariant, what I'll be showing you is how to actually compute it. So, bear with me, there, there, so there are a set of rules to actually computing it, and then we do some things, and then we'll see how it all falls out. Um, but the first thing that I'll have to, that I, that I, that I do want to say, that I can prove, so is that for a map of a knot with n crossings. The number of vertices, edges, um, and faces are going to be given by So the reason why this is going to be useful because in, in when computing the Alexander polynomial, what you need to do, so you're not going to be able to look at, he's generalizing a way to look at n crossings on a certain knot diagram. So you're going to be given an oriented knot diagram, and what you're going to do is you're going to be given a knot with n crossings, and from that knot with n crossings, you're going to, you're going to make, um, you're going to, a knot with n crossing actually ends up dividing the region into um, n plus 2 regions. And that's basically what this is saying, right? So how to prove this is actually, it's actually pretty short. Um, so we have, so we know that the vertices are just going to be the crossings, right? This is how we define vertices originally, right? Um, and then we can see that, okay, this can be done. I'll, I'll say it first and then if it works out well, it does. And if it doesn't, I'll give you a picture for it. Um, the vertex, every vertex has degree four. Is that so? Every vertex will look something like this. So every vertex will have degree four, right? Um, so the edges will just be four times the vertices over two, right? Because you actually only you only have two edges, but each each vertice has degree four. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. That was a great deal. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> right, which is just two in, right? And okay, and then lastly we conclude with uh, so we conclude with Euler's formula for polyhedron that the faces will just be equal to the edges plus two minus the vertices, which is in plus two. Right? Has everyone seen all this one for I think that was a yes. Okay. So I'll describe the method versus writing everything down. And then I'll just draw a picture as I describe what, what, what we're actually going to be doing. So in this method, what we do is we take an oriented diagram of a knot K within crossings. So, so we so 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 picture we have an oriented diagram of some knot K, and it's going to have it's going to have n crossings, and we're going to label these crossings C1 to Cn, and then by this result here that we'll call star. By star, there are n plus two regions, right? Um, and we'll label these regions R1 through Rn plus two, right? So from here, uh, so this is where I'll give a quick picture, and we'll leave this over here for bookkeeping. So for here, um, and I guess, let me make sure I use the word. Uh, and one. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be given this, and R naught would just be the complement of R naught. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at um, one one crossing, and then we're going to make a generalization for what's going to happen at each other crossing. So from, from here, um, how he does is he determines a linear, equa um, a linear equation by just starting at the first dot. These dots were just his notation to denote when an undercrossing actually happened, right? So we're going to use, so, so we're going to start at this dot, and what he does is for each region with um, a dot, he attaches um, a variable t to it. And as he goes around, he takes the alternating sum of these, and eventually getting back to where you started, you get that that's equal to zero. Right? So this is how he described his linear equation. It's equal to, okay, so we start here, and since this is a region with a dot, we give it a variable t. Right? Minus, okay, again, this is taking this alternating sum, and then since RL is a region with a dot, we give it this variable t, right? So forth. Uh, right? And this is how he determines this linear equation. So we can easily see then, what kind of matrix is this going to give us, right? We're going to have an n by n plus two matrix, right? So using, I guess we'll call this two, call this one. So using two, we get an n by n plus two matrix, right? And the next thing he does is in this n by, okay, so his, his polynomial will be determined by taking the determinant, right? So what he does is he, he turns this into a square matrix. So how he turns this into a square matrix will be literally, so he's given a um, matrix n, n plus two, right? Something that looks like this. And what he does is he takes neighbors, right? So two neighboring matrices, and he just deletes them, right? And what actually what this does, um, it, only, it only actually, um, messes up uh, our final result, which is going to be um, a polynomial and variables t, it only messes it up by, so we're only offset by plus or minus t to the k for k and z, right? 
And to actually remedy this result, he just normalizes it at the end. So when we get to our ending polynomial after we finish taking our determinant, we take out the largest power of t, right? Are those two columns? Yes, yes, those are two columns. So, so you take so it needs to be that you take neighboring columns, and neighboring columns will only offset you by this result. Any so, two or the on the furthest right? Well, just any two, just they, they just need to be neighboring, right? They're on the they're furthest right, not the cyclic permutation. Does, does the one at the far right and the one at the far left count as neighboring? The one to the far right, the one to the far left. No, the neighboring as in uh, <laughs> columns right by each other. Okay. Not as you know, if you shift by something, then you get to the other one because that's not how matrices work. Okay. 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 Okay.
don't know, well, his, I don't know, of the form, however, however you want to say it, plus or minus t, um, plus or minus uh, 1 or 0, right? Okay, so this allows us to determine our matrix, right? T, and make sure I'm writing this right, T, negative 1, negative T, 0, 0, negative 1, negative T, T, 0, negative 1, 1, 1, 1. Right, that's our matrix, right? And now we just have to take the determinant of that. Uh, but first, what we need to do is we need to use this method of getting two neighboring regions and deleting them. For convenience, since I started off uh, deleting the, the farthest things to the right, I'll do the same. So I'll come in here, I'll let these two things, and I'll get rid of them. All right? Okay. So now these correspond to uh, um, I'm the leader. Yeah, I'm the leader. So we have our matrix, then it's going to be. <coughs> Someone want to read out T, uh, you going down? T, 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 negative one, negative T, zero, zero, negative one. Okay, cool. So how we actually do this is just by using a cofactors, right? So this would be T, right? And how we want to picture this, okay, so we're using T, how we're gonna picture this then, we're gonna that's that's gonna be our square matrix, right? So we're gonna have negative T, negative one, zero, negative T, plus, and you see we don't have to do it for zero because we zero times that matrix, so we just have to do it for two. So we look at one. Remember, it's always minus, but then negative one, plus, right? So we're gonna look at deleting this and deleting t and zero, right? So we should get uh, t, negative one, t, negative t, right? And this ends up coming out to t cubed minus t squared plus t. I mean, the determinant of the square matrix is pretty easy. Um, and then what we do here again, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take out um, our largest value of t, which is going to do is going to normalize um, our result to remedy us deleting these two neighboring columns, right? So we're going to say, I guess I'll write it over here, and how he denotes it as delta k bar naught t is going to be equal to 1 minus t plus t squared. That's a polynomial, right? So I won't do another example. Um, I was gonna do another example, but I'll get into next. Okay, so it was it was Conway who came and created the Alexander Conway polynomial, and um, which he said that he showed that the scan relation together with the choice of a value on the unknot was enough to determine the polynomial. What basically what that means is um, given the scan relation and so so with a couple of axioms, we don't have to go through this whole creating a matrix process and you know getting down and dirty using cofactors and minors and things like that. Right? So definition. And I'll try to speed through it. Um, uh, so it's gonna be so so for an oriented link, um, it's Laurent polynomial meaning that the powers of z are going to be positive or negative, right? Um, and, okay, I couldn't hash out why this was true. So we're going to have the fact that um, the powers of our variable t will always lie in this field. Right, so that's one thing we just have to accept. But everything else is good. Um, and then these are the two axioms you get. Um, of the n naught. One and I want to do this. Uh, okay. 
and this is the other relation. Right? These are the two axes that he gives. That's just gonna. These are gonna be his scheme relations that he gives. And he's saying that with an oriented diagram and with these two relations, it's enough to determine the polynomial. Right? Okay, so what these diagrams look like, so I'm going to draw what actually these look like. So, again, this overcrossing, UD plus, um, undercrossing, uh, minus, and no crossings at all, B minus. Um, Sorry. I was actually planning to prove this result, but uh, given that you have something like this, two unlinked things, I'm going to call it zero. I have a before I want it. Talk to me. Uh, these aren't zeros, by the way. These are these are these are unknots. But that on the right is in fact a zero. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so. The last thing I ended up working out was this thing called the resolving tree. What it actually does is um, it takes the knot that you give it, and what you do is you use this relation and you break it up into its um, its easier components, right? So more straightforward, the the relation uh, we can write it as. So we'll be using this, which is the same thing as we wrote above. Just taking z to be this mess, right? Um, right. So instead of using this polynomial business, uh, well, this matrices, um, say I gave you something like this. So this is known as the resolving tree. So it's an example. Probably only have time to do one of these. Um, so let's make sure I do this right. Right, so this is just going to be the right truck oil. Right? And we're going to use our relation to actually break this down. Right? So we're going to view this right truck oil as being D plus, uh, notated by you know its positive orientation. Right? So using this, using this, what we're going to do is we're going to take we're going to take um, the negative oriented version of this, and we're going to take it with deleting deleting something because what, what D not does it unties the thing, right? It unties wherever you have a crossing, it unties it, right? So this is a positive crossing first that we're going to look at, right? So given it, so 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 taking uh, its negative orientation, what we do is we actually make this an undercrossing. So this will go. This will go over, right? And the thing actually becomes unknotted when you do that, right? If you take this, you put it up under and put that over, you can easily just pull this out. I'll leave that for other discussion. Um, so we actually get that the unknot is going to be isomorphic to this, right? That's this negative orientation, right? Uh, Okay, and how a denot is going to work is we're going to actually take this and we're just going to unknot it. So however you want to draw it, uh, right? Literally just took this crossing and just act like it wasn't there, just smooth it out, right? So now, so, so so now we can break these down a little more. And again, we're going to attach our variables that's in our relation, right? So we're going to break. So so we've already so. When you get to something and you break it down to the unknot, you can't go any further. So it's as simple as it can be. So that's it. But this, you can do some more breaking up because this is positive crossing. Right? So how we break this one up, uh, I'll call it star. Star 1 since I already used star 1 time. Um, you break it up. And so at this positive crossing, again, what you do is um, you take its negative component using our relation, right? And it becomes the unknot. Again, you just take this. And you put it over, right? And you get the unknot again. So you get something that looks like this. Right? And you see that the unknot, well, you actually get, actually get two of them, right? 
Um, and you have, let's see. And then here, uh, what you're gonna do with D not using our relation, just get rid of that, right? Just smooth it out and act like it's not dead. And you get something like this, right? Which is just gonna be, what it is it, right? And then this is enough, we're done. So now you just put all the pieces together. So just like you're factoring something, you just put all the things together. So you ended up getting that, okay, we're going to know it as this. So you have one times, so our link one, right here, our unknot, right? So remember, in our, in our relation, the unknot has polynomial value one, right? Um, plus z times one times our two things, right? Um, and lastly, um, z squared times our one thing. So as we're moving down the tree, z times z gives us our, our z squared. It kind of looks weird because I had to shift over here. But just how you, you're factoring things in multiplication, you do the same way to get the values for the chart, right? So this is just, again, 1 times 1 plus z times 1 times, what is this value? What did I say it was? Yeah. Yeah, zero, right? Um, plus z squared times 1, right? This is equal to 1 plus z squared. And then you just use this fact that um, Alexander's relation just has that z squared is, well, z is going to be equal to and what you do is you go in here, so this is for using Conway's scheme relation, right? And Alexander uses this notation, so del versus delta. I mean, I think it's called NAPL, I think. So then we have this. So plugging in z equals uh, t to 1 half minus uh, t to the negative 1 half, and you square that value, you get this. And this is, in fact, Alexander. So that bypasses the more convoluted method. Yes, yep, it does. Just accepting the relation, the scheme relation that he gave you, you're able to use this resolving tree and avoid, you know, using cofactors and minors and you know, avoid all that nasty arithmetic. You know, you just have to be smart when using a relation. It's literally just following the formula that it gives you in the relation. And then I think that's it.